Hello, this is Dr. Stephen Greer, and this is Conversations with Dr. Greer, and I would like to thank the people at the World Fusion Network for hosting us here every couple of weeks, and I'm the director of the Disclosure Project, uh, disclosureproject.org, and also the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, which we call for short CSETI, C-S-E-T-I dot org. And uh, I'm joined today uh, by uh, Raven Bolsey, who is on our board and who was uh, with us uh, just this past week at a fantastic event in England uh, in the area near Stonehenge and where all the extraordinary crop circles have appeared over the years. And we're going to be reviewing today really what happened at this amazing week uh, out in the English countryside because there were so many things that happened that we probably could fill a whole month of programs. Uh, but first, for those of you who are new to uh, what we're doing uh, at csetti.org, uh, we want to just cover a little bit about the concept of, of what we do. And it's really a very uh, complex on one level, but simple on another. Uh, program and, and it's about making contact with interstellar visitors that are visiting this planet from other star systems. There's abundant proof, which you can see at disclosureproject.org, where we now have over 550 military and top secret witnesses to events that have happened throughout the last few decades, and uh, that really prove the fact that we are being visited. And uh, what CSETI is doing and has been doing for now 21 years is establishing a protocol for making peaceful contact with these civilizations using a really advanced concept in consciousness. And actually it involves a lot of concepts that come from the Vedas and uh, which involve uh, us actually doing uh, meditation and pujas. Since we're on the World Puja Network, I'll talk very frankly about that. And the reason for that is that the science of consciousness is really the science of the next millennium. And I think most people who have studied even modern breakthroughs in physics, uh, in fact, breakthroughs that go back 100 years, uh, it's been well proven that the mind is an omnipresent field, a non-local field. And this is the central means for communicating faster than the speed of light. And one of the things that people often don't think about is that if we're being visited by civilization from another star system, how are they not only getting here, but how are they communicating? And clearly they're not going to be communicating with cell phones and radio waves and things of this sort because those go at velocities slower uh, than uh, what would be required to do it in any effective way. For example, uh, if you're from a, a star system fairly nearby in our galaxy, the Milky Way, that's, a, say, a thousand light years away, that's a, the, that, that distance is so vast that at the speed of light, say, what your cell phone or telephone signal or radio signal travels, it would take a thousand years to get a signal there and another thousand years for a reply, which is 2,000 years. And it's clear that the kinds of civilizations that are visiting the Earth, some of whom have been around for uh, literally millions of years, uh, are using a science, uh, and it is technological, that interfaces with thought and consciousness. And what we've done by discovering this is to uh, really connect sort of space-age scientific concepts with the science of consciousness and some of the ancient concepts that you find in the Vedas um, and Vedanta. And this really involves uh, teaching people to be able to go into deep, silent states of awareness and uh, see with their inner sight the civilizations, the spacecraft, the people, and then communicate with them and show them where we're located. So we actually not only practice something called, uh, in modern terms, remote viewing, but we also have a technique for then showing these civilizations where we are. And so uh, this past week when we were in England, we would literally uh, connect with them by showing them where we were uh, in the, the United Kingdom, and then we would show them going east of London, this countryside around Wiltshire near Stonehenge, and then we would show them the specific farm where we were located, and then we would vector them, like you would vector a jet into LAX or JFK Airport, but we're using coherent thought. And this is something we call coherent thought sequencing. And the protocols for that are actually in a new iPhone app. If you have an iPhone or an iPad that you can get at the uh, App Store 
the Apple Store. And there's a CSETI uh, program for that and also a training program at DisclosureProject.org. And what we were doing in England is something we started doing in 1992, and that is take groups of people out to where uh, the epicenter of these historic and really amazing crop circles have appeared, and also near these ancient Neolithic sites such as Stonehenge, a Silbury Hill, uh, Avebury, uh, and places like that, and uh, engage in this protocol to make contact with these civilizations and invite them to make contact with us. And so we first went there in 1992, and we've been a number of times. I guess this would be our some like 10th or 11th year that we have uh, visited this area, and we never cease to be astounded with what happens. Now, in these protocols, we also have uh, we use high-powered lasers that we send up into the space, uh, some of which will be seen in, in clearer about 200 miles into space. And then we also have some electronic tones, which are also in this iPhone app, uh, that uh, are beeping tones that were recorded by the BBC in a crop circle in the late 1980s, about 1989. And thanks to Colin Andrew, who has provided this with to us, um, we discovered that these tones are very unique, and we then broadcast those from the site sort of as an electromagnetic beacon. So we use thought, sound, and light, those three things in these protocols that we use to make contact. And the, the philosophical underpinning of this is that since our State Department and the United Nations have not dealt with this issue properly, and there is no a peace initiative with these civilizations. It's all been kept very secret. We feel there should be a citizen's diplomatic effort, and that's really what CSETI is doing with what we call the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind Initiative, or CE5 Initiative, and that's when humans go out and set up a protocol to uh, deliberately make contact with these extraterrestrial civilizations within the construct of universal cosmic mind and universal peace. And, and our intent is to establish peaceful contact with these civilizations, regardless of where they're from, and do it within the context of the, the realization that humans being conscious and awake and these civilizations being sentient beings who are also conscious and awake, that the mind that we share is a singularity, as Erwin Schrodinger who was a physicist who really was the father of modern quantum mechanics stated, and he actually started particle wave theory back in 1908. He said that the, the total number of minds in the universe is one, and that is it's a singularity. And what we experience in this meditative state is that oneness of awareness. And that is really the meeting place where both humans and non-human but advanced intelligence can meet. And these civilizations, which are from star systems, some of which are outside our galaxy, the closest galaxy to our Milky Way is two and a half million light years away. And CSETI has literally had contact with ambassadors from uh, these other civilizations, as extraordinary as a claim as that may sound. We actually have proof of this, and, and, and uh, the person who will be joining us in a moment actually uh, took a photograph about a year and a half ago of a, an interstellar being from the Andromeda Galaxy who visited us up uh, in Southern California uh, back in November of 2009, about a year and a half ago. So this is what we're doing, and it's, it's a program that now has reached thousands of people all over the world. And, and what was exciting about England is that we had people there from a number of countries, from America, Canada, um, Denmark, uh, the Czech Republic, uh, Norway, of course, England, uh, and uh, uh, Belgium, and other countries. And uh, it was really a wonderful uh, expedition under the, under the stars uh, and uh, under the skies of, of southern England in these very sacred places. And this particular trip is a little different than some of these expeditions we do because during the day we would go out and go to the new uh, – crop circle formations that were reported that morning. And what's interesting is that a number of crop circle formations appeared 
and, and no one in the world knows this until this particular interview we're doing right now, uh, after we had visualized components of them, and that next morning they would be found in a field and would have components of what we had uh, done in our meditation the night before or that very night. And uh, this has happened before. If you go to cseti.org, cseti.org, you'll see our logo. It's an equilateral triangle. That started in 1992 when about 12 of us went up to uh, this beautiful place near uh, Silbury Hill. Uh, we had the use of an 1,800-acre private farm to do this and in, in, in with the security and privacy. And we made contact with the extraterrestrial civilizations. That year we actually had about a 100-foot diameter disc, uh, what some would call a flying saucer, uh, materialized in a field uh, just a few uh, hundred uh, feet from us. And that year, 1992, we also visualized and transmitted mentally to the crop circle makers uh, these extraterrestrial civilizations that are creating some of these amazing crop circles. Um, and we showed them a very specific form, and that was three circles connected by lines making an equilateral triangle. The next morning after we did this exercise, that exact crop circle was found in a field not far from our location, actually within line sight. So this is very, very exciting. And so this tradition continued this year, and we have a number of really exciting uh, events to to share with you. So with that, the you know, 10 minute or so introduction of what we do and how we do it. I'd like to now welcome uh, Raven Nabulsi, who is here and who is with us on this expedition uh, with her husband, who actually invented the uh, iPhone app that I referred to. For those of you who want to have that on your iPhone, it actually uh, is, is a very useful tool. It actually helps turn your iPhone into a magnetic field detector or magnetometer. Uh, which will also signal when an extraterrestrial vehicle is nearby. So, Raven, thank you. And if you want to share some of the things that happen that stand out in your mind, uh, please do so. Thank you, um, Doctor, for having me. And, um, yeah, like right off the bat, the, the very first night um, we were out in the field, we you led us um, through an amazing meditation, and we were visualizing this tetrahedron. And um, the next morning, there was this fantastic um, crop circle that appeared near Etchell Hampton that was an enormous um, multidimensional tetrahedron. And um, I, this was my first trip to England, and what really amazed me is that when you go into these crop circles, you, it doesn't really look like much when you're on the ground except just like a big mess of you know, we scramble together, but when you're up above it, um, when you see the aerial views of these circles, it's just, it, it looks like a woven pattern that's just amazing. And uh, so that, you know, was the first first big one where we, we actually meditated on this form, and then the next day, not far from where we were, this, this huge formation appears. And um, we also... Um, had on on the actual anniversary of the landing in uh, Alton Barnes of the the craft back in the 90s. Right. Uh, we there was a lot of military activity that night, um, and we we were having all the like helicopters buzzing us and all kinds of things. It finally got quiet, and um, we. Again, we're focusing, doing a meditation, and then um, another circle appeared, which was this um, like a Fibonacci sequence um, that was another huge formation uh, near Windmill Hill. Yes, and, and you know, but going back to this Etchell Hampton, I just want to mention that one of the meditations that we did that night involved um, a using a mantra that we use in our meditation. And it's a three-syllable mantra with a certain tonality that actually creates a triangular form. But when you repeat it three times, it makes a tetrahedron. And we made a, a double tetrahedron uh, where the bases are kind of merged halfway into each other, which creates what's called a merkaba. And this uh, double tetrahedron uh, was something that we used to uh, 
uh, then go into space visually and make contact with these extraterrestrial civilizations. And what's fascinating about the Edge Hill Hampton crop circle is that the, the, the motif of it is a hyperdimensional tetrahedral form. And it, it literally, when, you're in, when we went into this particular crop circle, what was amazing is that parts of it where you get the sense of three-dimensionality from the air, when you're in it, it's just the, the standing pieces of wheat just slightly fluffed up or, or altered, which is so precise. But from when you're on, from on the ground, which seems uh, when, when you're right in it, you really can't appreciate it until you get up above it. And so the aerial photography of it reveals this sort of three-dimensional and hyper-dimensional tetrahedral form. And it's not a coincidence, in my opinion, that this appeared – not at all far from where we were staying, um, maybe 20 to 25 minute drive. Um, if you don't get lost, <laughs> which some people did, but but it, you know, and and that again, <clears throat> excuse me, it's this motif that keeps repeating, and that is that these civilizations have very advanced means of of uh, communicating. Uh, and while, of course, humans have the intuitive ability to remote view and what have you, these civilizations have that, but also have electromagnetic devices that pick up clear, coherent thought that's emanating from this expanded state of mind as clearly as you and I are, are talking on a telephone or, or we talk on a cell phone. And I think that realizing that and seeing this actually happen in real time was an extraordinary thing for I, everyone there and certainly for, for myself that next morning when we, we saw the report of this particular uh, hyperdimensional tetrahedral type uh, crop circle that appeared. And uh, I think that this kind of experience um, is extraordinary. When we were in the crop circle, we actually had some extraordinary electromagnetic signals that came in through both our magnetometer and our electromagnetic radar detectors, which were battery-operated. And we were out in a very vast rural area. There was nothing man-made that would have made this happen. And we began to have this uh, communication that came through the electronic devices uh, and, and I tell people this is a type of trans-dimensional or going across dimensions electromagnetic contact that has begun uh, increasingly uh, to occur over the last two or three years, and it's rapidly increasing, uh, particularly since 2007 and 2008, to where now we're getting a very specific communication that happens uh, at key points, and there's actually... Uh, a, a sort of an encoded message within it. And well, this is really a, an extraordinary thing to witness because these are devices which, while not very expensive, um, would normally uh, be completely silent out in rural areas unless you were you know, near a police radar gun or something of that sort. And, uh, of course, we were nowhere near anything like that. And uh, the kind of communication that happens uh, is so specific. It's such specific points in a meditation or specific places, like in this particular crop circle, that it's uh, absolutely no coincidence. Yeah, and um, I know towards the end of last week, we had visited a um, circle that um, people were calling the Mayan circle, but I know you had a much better explanation for it. And that's when we had this amazing transmission through the magnetometer, and it I mean, it went on for over an hour where it was making all these interesting tones and things that normally it's not supposed to do. And that was, that was just amazing. And people were actually feeling um, physically, you know, like things were happening to them. It, it was totally like we were being downloaded with information. And then later that night, um, towards the end of the evening, there was a huge burst of light that came from – above us when we were out in the field and that was very similar to what happened after the Orion transmissions in Joshua Tree a couple of years ago. We had this download of information coming through the, at that time, the radar detector and then there were these huge bursts of light later on in the evening. So I thought it was interesting that it was kind of a similar phenomenon that happened this time. 
right, and I don't think a coincidence. In fact, uh, it, there's a book that uh, came out about a year and a half ago called uh, Contact, Countdown to Transformation, and it has with it a DVD that has these tones on it, as well as many photographs of the extraterrestrial vehicles and experiences we've had over the years, and you can get that at disclosureproject.org. And when you hear these tones, um, the thing that strikes many people is that it, it, it goes through a series of patterns and even pitches and uh, volumes that are, in a sense, very emotional. And yet this is just an electromagnetic detector that if you were to put it near what would normally set it off, it just goes, eh. and it, you know, there's no such thing that happens. And what we've discovered is that in addition to seeing objects that appear and uh, lights and orbs and beings, we, we're having this constant level of electromagnetic signal contact through these electronic devices. And it's not as if they're actually doing this linearly. They're doing it from within space-time. Because what's fascinating is that we can have an identical device within 20 feet of us or even three or four feet of us and it will be silent and yet one device that they're choosing to communicate through will be doing this this long sequence communication lasting an hour or two and this is not physically possible if you had a man-made source that was just uh, say electromagnetic signal coming from uh, a radar gun or a microwave tower all the devices would go off on the same frequency, making the same sound at the same time. This isn't happening. And, and it's really when you witness it and analyze it, you realize the specificity of these extraterrestrial civilizations and how they're choosing to communicate. And then what I attempt to do is to sense what they're saying and help communicate it, as do other people who intuitively are sensing what, what the, the, the signaled pattern is, is trying to communicate. And it's really quite profound. Now, what happened at this particular um, crop circle formation near, near Silbury Hill, and those of you who, who, who may know the area, there's a West Kennet Long Barrow, which is a 5,500-year-old burial ground, Neolithic. And then right across the, the road from that is this 4,500-year-old um, you know, conical-shaped man-made or allegedly man-made structure. Um, and what we have found is that there's this extraordinary uh, series of events that have happened in the last year, year and a half in, in, in that region, including the C-SETI contact teams. And we were in this particular crop circle, which has sort of a stepped pyramid motif around the border and then has what looks like a head or with a third eye in it in the center. And we were in that area near the third eye of, of this crop circle. And we were sitting, and I had this magnetic field meter as a magnetometer, and it actually picks up fluctuations in the magnetic field. So normally it just doesn't do anything unless you put it near a motor or something like that. And we were out in this huge rural area in this crop circle in this wheat field. And on my that was in my left hand. In my right hand, I was holding an ancient... Tibetan Lama's Droji, and those of you who may not know what that is, it's, it's something that the Tibetan Lamas would use for rapid enlightenment, and it has an iron core and then sort of a brass uh, ornate surrounding. And those two items, the magnetometer on my left hand and the, and the drosia on my right hand, I made into a triangle connecting to the electromagnetic field of my heart chakra. And at that instant, this um, being, this extraterrestrial being, came through this system and did this over hour-long uh, communication, which was not only moving but an extraordinary experience for me personally. I think everyone there as well. Um, and during that period, uh, Raven took a photograph and actually got a photograph of a disc-shaped craft that was over towards the direction of Silbury Hill. Right. Um, I kind of was in this meditative state that you had led us into and that's kind of what I do when I'm in that state. I'll try to, you know, connect with the ETs and then I use my camera as an instrument. And so I was kind of randomly snapping photos and I did manage to get a little disc, like you said, um over near Silbury Hill. Right. And um the other thing that was interesting is there was another uh, magnetometer similar to yours in the circle 
um, and it was going off too, but there was definitely something that was, you know, communicating through yours in these elaborate patterns um, that was, you know, not at all like what the other person's magnetometer was doing. So it was very directional and purposeful. Right, and it well, and and this was a sort of a, a a recapitulation or expansion of what happened in Colorado last month, or I should say, in late June. And we were there, and we had the, uh, this magnetometer, and it was between me and a member of our team, Emory, uh, who actually owns this particular device, and it did the most extraordinary. Uh, very long communication that was almost like a symphony, and we had um, a, an audio expert analyze it. And this particular device can't make these kind of sounds normally, and uh, it, it's just that's technically not possible. And it had a sort of symphonic quality to it. And this is through what would appear to be, you know, I mean, it's, it's not a very expensive device. And I think it's very beautiful that you have the SETI project, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, um, which is really a, a smoke screen for pretending to look for extraterrestrial signals through the radio antennas that have spent countless tens of millions of dollars using Arecibo and these vast antennas. Uh, and, of course, they claim they've had no signals. And we're there with these you know, $100, $200, $300 um, electromagnetic devices getting extraordinary communication, which most of the scientific world is, is choosing right now to ignore. But I predict in the future will be noted as being quite historic um, because they are. And uh, it's really exciting to be witnessing this. And, of course, uh, you know, having just come back, a few days ago from the United Kingdom, uh, it's still fresh in my awareness what beautiful contact it was and what they were communicating to us. And uh, it, it, it just, uh, it had, the meaning was really about the fact that they're here, they're wanting us to uh, create with them this time of universal peace, that the time is coming where the Age of Enlightenment will be established on Earth, and Earth then will be welcomed amongst other star systems, which is really our long-term destiny as a people and as a planet, that Earth take her place and humanity take their place amongst these other civilizations, some of which have been really observing our development for millions of years, and other civilizations we're finding uh, are more recently being introduced to us. And we have this entire myriad uh, uh, array of, of different civilizations that we, uh, over the course of a week, will have this sort of contact with. And some of it will be visual. Some of it will be craft that will be photographed. Some will be actual beings that will be photographed, uh, which you can see at CSETI.org. And some will be these sort of electromagnetic communications, which uh, is escalating in a way that's quite profound and uh, moving and which has a certain urgency to it. My own sense of it being the director of the project is that the time for this, these huge changes of this transformation on this planet is exponentially increasing and the option of denying these facts will be closed soon, that this is going to be uh, not possible, that the world will any longer be able to deny not only our place in the universe, but the fact that we've never been alone and that uh, we're challenged now with this task of making peaceful contact with these civilizations, uh, creating world peace and universal peace and also bringing forward these sciences, not just the sciences and consciousness, which are very key and the foundation of the future civilization on Earth, but these electromagnetic sciences, not only for communication, but for energy generation and propulsion and what have you, because clearly we cannot go forward for hundreds and, or even that, or never, I don't even think dozens of years, but certainly not hundreds to thousands of years using coal and nuclear power and uh, oil. Uh, we're going to have to allow these interdimensional technologies that pull energy, free energy, out of the fabric, a fabric of space-time, which the uh, intelligence community and, and corporate world have, have actively suppressed uh, for over 100 years. And 
these extraterrestrial civilizations know that it's a matter of some urgency because some of the information that we're getting and also that Colin Andrews is getting is that the time is very short for this and that there is a huge amount of concern about what is happening to Gaia, the Earth, uh, because Earth is being stressed like uh, it has never been stressed by what humans are doing because of how we live. Uh, and how we're living on the earth is a direct result of the suppression of this information. A lot of people do not see the connection between the environment and the ecological catastrophes that are happening and the social political catastrophes and economic uh, problems and the fact that uh, humanity has been withheld from having this knowledge and having the physics and science behind these technologies available to us so that we are uh, over a hundred years into a period when we could have had so-called free energy, energy coming from the quantum vacuum and the zero-point energy field uh, that we have, talk about a lot at the orionproject.org if you want to read those uh, papers and information there. But also the, the fact that when you know th these technologies first began being suppressed, there were maybe two billion people on Earth, most of whom did not have electrification and technology. Now we have 7 billion people with 2.5 billion in China and India ra rapidly industrializing, but almost exclusively with coal-fired power plants and things. And I am certain that these extraterrestrial civilizations are frankly appalled of what, what's happening. And I know that the Earth, which is a conscious living being, and it is female, the, the Earth is definitely a female conscious being. And she is uh, really at a point where we have to lift this burden. And, and some of the information that's been coming from people who've studied these crop circles and the message within them and the sort of experiences we've been having over the last few years with our contact programs clearly have to do with that message and the fact that really, uh, you know, they're not going to land on the White House lawn and force this issue. Uh, you know, I mean, I remember when Larry King asked me you know, famously, why don't they just land on the White House lawn? And, you know, of course, I said, well, you know, which White House? And the, the fact is, is that it's not something that can just be imposed from outside. It's something that requires the enlightenment and awakening of humanity to uh, not only the science of consciousness and universal consciousness and, and cosmic mind, uh, which is the foundation for enlightenment, but also these sciences, because the sciences that we already have on Earth would give us a society without poverty, without pollution, without the need for fighting over commodities and resources, and an entire new economic system. And this is something which is an enormous undertaking, and I think because it's been so enormous, I mean, we can witness how, how dysfunctional Washington and other governments are on relatively trivial things. Um, but this is such an enormous undertaking that it just keeps getting kicked down the road. And that's why we, the people, need to become ambassadors uh, emissaries of peace, as it were, from humanity to these civilizations. We need to work for disclosure of the truth, and we need to work for the development and the release for peaceful uses these extraordinary technologies which are being uh, clearly uh, shown to us but also clearly have been uh, ruthlessly suppressed by uh, special interests that don't want this to happen. And all of this part is part and parcel of a, of a, of a larger theme, and that is that humanity is at these, this critical crossroad where it's going to have to choose to make a very large uh, step forward, uh, leaving behind the old ways and embracing this new information, new sciences, new consciousness. And, and uh, that, that is something that is a theme that we keep receiving from not only these extraterrestrial visitors, but from higher dimensional consciousness. And uh, the Earth herself is speaking to this, um, I think. And, and I think for that reason, it's, uh, it, it's necessary for everyone to ask the question what it is that they can be doing to advance our civilization in the correct direction and to uh, correct the imbalances 
that have developed over the last hundred years because of the uh, unnecessary suppression of this information. And uh, so that's part of the themes that you're that we keep finding. Now, the other thing I want to point out about this particular event is that the beings that were communicating with this magnetic field aberration, this magnetometer that was fluxing and making these sounds, are the same beings that have been seen. They're very rather tall. I mean, I'm six foot four, and, and my sense of it is that they're taller than I am. Very luminous. And last year, you might recall, oh, we mentioned this, and uh, Colin Andrews, who coined the term crop circle, got a report from a police officer that went out to one of these areas, the crop circles near Silbury Hill, where apparently a farmer had been reported uh, firing into the field because they didn't want people to go into the field where there was a crop circle. So he went to investigate this, and he was with the Wiltshire Police, the, the county of Wiltshire, which is where we were doing this, and he saw this tall, luminous extraterrestrial being fully materialized in this field, and he started chasing it. <laughs> so, of course, I mean, the, the, this extraterrestrial fled, but as he approached, this being actually dematerialized right in front of his face. And there were footsteps that they documented where this being ran off into the field, the crop, and the footsteps just diminished into no, into nowhere. Now, this is exactly what you, we know happens because these extraterrestrial civilizations have the ability to materialize and dematerialize. It's a bit like the you know stories you hear about the enlightened masters in the Himalayas or in the Shambhala kingdom who could could materialize bodies and craft and what have you and and what we're finding is that there's a great deal of concordance between uh, the understanding of the ancient vedic cities s i d d h i s the advanced powers and abilities and these extraterrestrial manifestations if you will that uh, are while well, more high-tech than just using one's consciousness to do it, involve the same principles in trans-dimensional, hyper-dimensional reality where the conscious universe and uh, the so-called astral worlds of light and visualized thought interface with the subtle energies and linear space and time and materialization. And so what we have found is that we will have something like we were just talking about, and Raven mentioned this brilliant light that burst right above us. Um, and what that was was a craft that was actually sending an energy wave through all the participants in the circle. And we literally sit in a circle, a concentric circle, uh, as we're doing this. And what what that was is a, a download where everyone is energized and filled with vision and information and packets. And these are kinds of experiences that most people have no idea that they'll have when they just come out you know, for the first time on one of these expeditions. But it's happening with greater regularity, actually. Right. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about was such a beautiful thing. There had been cows um, on the hill where we had set up, and they were kind of roaming around throughout the week. And on one particular evening, you did a puja, and right on our site, and as we stood in a circle, the cows themselves had huddled in a little mass just a few feet outside of us, just watching. And as the puja went on, one by one, they just laid down in the field and sat there for the for at least over an hour in, in this very peaceful state that was um, created by sending out all this good energy. Well, it was very beautiful because I was doing the puja, which those of you, and this is right, the World Puja Network, why not talk about this, right? Um, it, it's a Sanskrit. Uh, the one I do is a Sanskrit ceremony. It's very ancient. It's an honoring of the masters and the ascended masters and the uh, bringing forth of this cosmic awareness into the individuals and into earth. And it's 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 very powerful to do a puja. And this was the first time that I've ever done one every single day and night that we've been out. And this particular time, these huge cows were you know, literally four or five feet outside of our circle watching us. And then they knelt down one by one till all of them were sitting in this state of just beatific peace while this puja and while our meditation went on. And, and it was 
beautiful. I mean, even though it was something involving animals, but they knew. You know, animals pick up and know this kind of spiritual energy and higher consciousness. And um, it, it was very touching, actually, uh, I felt, um, because they were participating in their own way with this meditation and with the puja. That was very beautiful. And um, I noticed there's this huge correlation between, you know, what we're doing and also how just nature around us responds, like in the case of these cows. And also in meditation um, and consciousness, there's been, there were many evenings when it was clouded over. And after our meditation, a, a perfect circle um, opened up above us and you could see all the stars. And it's it's another sort of orchestrated thing that occurs when you're in that conscious state of consciousness. Yeah, there's a wonderful Vedic saying, uh, Sanskrit, that translates means collect around sattva. And sattva, S-A-T-V-A, are, is kind of the purity of pure consciousness. And nature, the support of nature and the cooperation of nature happens when we're doing this because it is it's literally the experience of higher states of consciousness and it's very beautiful and we do have this phenomenon where the sky will literally open up just around us and uh, in fact you know, it had rained for two months uh, and was cold and rainy every day until we landed there and it cleared off and we, we never had so much as maybe a little mist on one day and every other day we had no rain at all and of course the local people who were from great britain were were kind of shocked because it, the weather had been so dreadful um for so many weeks for at least two months um and they were really surprised and but this happens quite frequently with these expeditions and it has to do with the collective consciousness of the whole group becoming coherent going into higher states of consciousness and the intent of the group and then Gaia and people forget that, that earth is a conscious intelligent living being and that nature does participate as well as these interstellar civilization it's all part and parcel of this conscious hologram that is the universe where you begin to realize that the entire cosmos every star every photon every plant every being is consciousness resonating and phasing as that thing or that being and that state of unity awareness and, and cosmic awareness uh, really creates all of the phenomenon uh, that, that 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 a lot of times to people seems impossible or miraculous or bizarre but it's quite understandable once you understand that the universe is a conscious hologram uh, that is perfectly integrated at the level of cosmic mind which is also the mind within us people forget that we're awake and that awake mind is that universal mind and that when you become silent and your mind becomes calm and pure you then experience that universality and I believe that's the foundation of the next 500,000 year yuga this age of enlightenment we're going we're entering into right now it that it really is centered on the experience of that and so a lot of people don't realize that these sea seti uh, expeditions are as much as anything um, a retreat in meditation and cosmic awareness in fact that is the central thing that we teach and share and from that then come the abilities that people have to remote view to contact these civilizations to have them contact us and we have found that as soon as the group reaches a certain level of this kind of coherence of mind that's when the spacecraft appear or the beings appear that they actually are looking for groups of humans to link up and experience that state because otherwise the history of humanity is that the strangeness of otherness whether it's you know a different race a different religion a different nationality a different whatever has been the root of people going into states of separation and then violence and so the the the, the anecdote to that kind of darkness and separation is unity consciousness and cosmic awareness and these civilizations absolutely understand that because if you are traveling faster than the speed of light you certainly understand these other dimensions and the interface of 
how this whole universe is, in fact, conscious and how conscious mind is utilized. And, and about 19, 20 years ago, I wrote a paper that talks about consciousness-assisted technologies where the mind of these extraterrestrials are actually interfacing with their craft and their, their communication devices, but that they also have technologies that assist consciousness and that there's this very perfect integration that occurs at a certain level of enlightenment and development in a civilization where even the what we think of as materialistic sciences and technologies begin to take on this deeper understanding of uh, uh, transdimensional reality where the whole cosmos is conscious and awake. And that is really the foundation of what we're doing with these expeditions as ambassadors uh, to the universe. And and I think that's why the kinds of experiences we're, we're having uh, as, as people begin to learn the meditation, the mantra experience, the pujas, it creates this coherence that then opens the possibility, a portal, if you will, uh, in that coherent field of awareness for these extraordinary things to occur. Absolutely. It's it's always interesting to see, like, as the week progresses, you know, pe- people start to bond more, and it, it absolutely happens that way. And also, I just noticing, you know, some of the participants, um, they were starting to really, you know, see like ETs on the ground and to just verify that, you know, that's what they were seeing. They asked the ET to maybe um, do something with the magnetometer or with the radar detector and it would absolutely go off, you know, right when they had that thought. So, I mean, it's it's so neat that, you know, we take one little step towards them and they're willing to, you know, come two steps towards us to help make this connection. It's just so beautiful. Yeah, and in fact, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a trillion steps because I mean these these civilizations have come from star systems that are vast and, and very far away, and yet you know they're approaching the Earth at a time where unfortunately our military classified projects have weapon systems that will target them. And in fact, uh, after we had some extraordinary sightings, we had military helicopters fly over our site at, I don't know, less than 200 feet. I mean, directly over us, as well as jets and and other other military uh, aircraft. And, And this has happened before. And what I tell people is that we're never concerned about it because we put it all in sort of a, a cosmic universal light of peace, but that we we we, conf- we inform these extraterrestrial civilizations to, to contact us in a way that's safe and appropriate for that time and place. And that's what happens. For example, there were several nights where we had um, brilliant uh, golden and bluish white craft that would just materialize very quickly, but very, very close to us that a number of people would see all at once. And we have also photographed these um, at close range. And then after that, then there would be, you know, two or three military choppers that would get vectored in, or maybe they picked it up from satellite reconnaissance. But it doesn't stop the contact because it, we're at a point where we are conscious enough and the extraterrestrial civilizations are willing uh, and, and eager to make this sort of contact that, that we can maneuver around this sort of silliness, I call it, um, of, of these uh, military efforts to suppress this kind of contact. But And yet, we're, we're very conscious that that's there, and so that's why we always and, you know, ask that the, these ETs uh, appear in some way that's safe for everybody, and that's what they do. They do it in all kinds of ways that are quite beautiful. Absolutely. Um, the other thing that I thought was really interesting was um, that the storm tracker that was locked onto you throughout the entire week, and it was shutting itself off and doing all kinds of things. Yeah, there's a, a one device we have we haven't talked about that really picks up. It's supposed to pick up lightning bolt strikes that are very close when you're. It was developed for people out on boats and, and wilderness events, and it's called a storm tracker. But it actually is something that picks up an, the electromagnetic discharge of a lightning strike. And what is interesting about this that's happened is that it's really locked on to us. And and the the lead car, my car, whenever we would be in motion, even though there's no electrical storms anywhere within a thousand miles of where we were, 
um, this would lock on, and even at every turn and roundabout we'd go through, it would signal. It was like a cosmic GPS, and they would signal to us, and it was clearly coming from, and at times we've actually photographed this craft. It's a, it's a guardian ship. I call it the guardian ship, where it's an extraterrestrials that are actually watching out after us. And I will have it in my backpack, and it would do it up to the point that I would literally put my backpack down at 3 in the morning or 2 in the morning uh, in my room. And, and as soon as I did that, one final time, it would go off to signify they had locked on exactly where we were. And what's interesting is that a couple of anomalous things happen, which are technically impossible. For example, one particular time, this device uh, – turned itself off after the, the we were safely back at our where we were staying. And to do that, you have to push an indented button, and it did it quite on its own, and the batteries were fine. It did a number of things like this, which it's actually never done before. And what you realize is that these civilizations have the ability to be within the space around us and interface with these electronics in, in unbelievably specific ways where they let you know that they're there and that they're communicating and they're watching over us, in fact. Um, and th that it, it, it's actually very beautiful and endearing and on a certain level, although it, it's for when people first hear it and see it, they go, what in the world? It's like a WTF moment. How is this doing this? Because there's nothing that should make this happen because there is no lightning or anything like that within hundreds of miles of where we are. And it would have to be within a few miles for this detector to go off because it's, it's literally a lightning strike warning system. So what we find is that th there's deep concern and interest in, in what we're doing, and they find a lot of different ways to do it. I mean, we never thought that this particular device would be used by them in this way. But they chose to do that. And so, you know, we never – every time we think we've seen it all, something else happens that's, in a sense, more wonderful, if not at times bizarre, than the other things that we've seen. Yeah. It never ceases to amaze us. <laughs> it never ceases to – yeah. It never ends. It never ends. It never ends. Oh. <laughs> Really quite beautiful. Um, I have to say this particular group was also amazingly coherent, and uh, you know they had received all the meditation training materials beforehand, and they were it, the, the group itself had a great coherence, and and this is what uh, I, I really enjoy is seeing the development over the course of a week. I mean, it's only a week that we're together. And, in fact, we're going to be doing another one of these at, uh, in Southern California. We're going to go to this enormous 700,000-acre wilderness area in October. And those of you who are interested, you can find out about it at cseti.org. Um, it's probably going to fill up fairly quickly, but there's still some space. And it's October 23rd to the 29th, and it's this enormous desert wilderness area that – is um, one of the few places in the United States that's been certified as a quote-unquote dark skies community because of the great viewing of the stars. Um, and the community is a very conscious, but it's surrounded by this 700,000-acre park. And that's where we're going to be doing this. Not too far. It's a couple hours from L.A. and San Diego in the California desert in the Southern California area. And uh, we're going to be doing this there. Uh, and... Uh, the group will, you know, probably be around 23 or 24 people, and we're very much looking forward to that. So that those of you who uh, are inspired or, or feel moved to come, uh, go to cseti.org, and you can find out about that. And if you can't come, there's uh, actually a whole training kit that involves the meditation process, the technique for remote viewing and making contact, the uh, electromagnetic tones that we send out, and all the protocols, and that's available uh, at the website at disclosureproject.org uh, if you can't make it to one of these expeditions. I know for many people it's hard to make it the time away and travel to do it, but um, if you can, it's a great experience for folks, I, we found. And and uh, 
we, there's another thing that's happening that's very important, and that is all the people who have been coming to these are being linked up through a uh, person who's volunteering on our team to do group meditations with hundreds of these people all over the world on specific nights and during specific events to create a global meditation network for making contact with these uh, civilizations. And so we have people going out, I mean, from Malaysia to South Africa, all over Europe, everywhere, uh, doing this. And one of the things that I'm convinced is happening is that as more and more people do this and understand the state of cosmic awareness needed, to achieve the transition that we're, we're 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 making as a people, that as Rupert Sheldrake has talked about, it creates a morphogenic field where people joining in this kind of coherence and meditation process and intent um, manifest the future. That's how the future comes to pass is through these sort of efforts at a very profound level of consciousness. And this is why the more people that do it the better, because they've done studies, as you, most people on this program would have, will know about, by Dr. John at uh, uh, Princeton Engineering uh, uh, Anomalies Research Lab, the Peer Lab, where they found that if two people are in a state of meditation and coherence, it, it has uh, like 10 times the effect of just one person uh, on, say, an, uh, a mechanical system or what have you. So if you look at the whole globe as a, a, a connected network of intelligent life, including the earth herself, that the more people that are in a certain state of coherence for universal peace, enlightenment, uh, for the uh, uh, unveiling of these advanced sciences and technologies that can get the earth off of this collision course that we're on with the environmental uh, crises and what have you, that the more that people are doing that, the more it creates this shift. Um, and uh, it's a little bit like the hunter's monkey effect, where they, you know, found that, you know, if, if, if there's an island of monkeys and, and a certain population of them begin to learn a new social skill on distant islands where there's no physical contact, the monkeys begin to do the same thing and know it spontaneously. And it's because of the, the interconnectivity of the non-local nature of consciousness and mind. And so we know that as humans, we have this enormous power that's within us to connect to that level of awareness and manifest the good future and manifest this a big transition. It's the biggest transition in the recorded history of the human race that we're in the midst of. And the more people who are doing it, the more uh, powerful it'll be and the more successful it'll be. So that's one of the things that's also happening uh, that a member of our team is coordinating for, for folks who come on these expeditions who then stay connected through that network. Yes. Um Gosh, I don't know what else. There's so many things that happened. Did you want to talk about that one formation that uh, one of the ladies saw, but then we couldn't go into the field? It, it was like that giant sort of snake-like crop circle with the circle in the middle? Oh, yeah. There was a, a woman on the team who was from Norway uh, who the, the night that this particular enormous crop circle appear, appeared, um, had seen and actually drew out for everyone uh, a shape that was very, very similar to this crop circle that appeared. And we actually passed it around. We're sitting with our flashlights in the middle of the night up on this hill uh, out in, in, in Wilshire. And we are all meditating on it. And the next day is reported this crop circle that has an amazing level of correlation. It wasn't identical, but it was so similar. It had so many features that were similar to it. Um, that it, it was uncanny. And unfortunately, that particular crop circle, the farmer was not happy that it appeared in his field, and he, he harvested it that very afternoon uh, and cut it down. But um, luckily, there, were, there was an aircraft uh, that went up and took a photograph of it prior to it being uh, destroyed. Um, but really, the most extraordinary crop circles of the season happened around the time that we arrived and while we were there, and a number of them had direct connection to the meditations, whether it was uh, the Merkaba and the tetrahedral meditation using the mantra, whether it was this particular um, uh, crop circle or 
uh, the one that we were in where we had this enormous uh, download of communication through the electronics and through our consciousness that actually appeared the morning that we landed in England uh, and had a, a very Vedic, it was almost like a cosmic mandala uh, placed in this crop circle in this field near this, this ancient Silbury Hill. So, um, you know, I, these, these are just wonderful experiences. And uh, we hope soon to come out with another sort of second volume of, of Contact Countdown the Transformation because literally in the last year and a half, we have quadrupled the number of photographs and electronic tones and experiences that we've had because what I see happening is an exponential increase in contact because the time for this big transformation on Earth is, is really upon us. So, well, I think we our hour is up. So I would like to thank you, Raven, for, for sharing your thoughts and, and uh, uh, experiences from being there for your first time in England. I'm so glad you and, and your husband, Todd, were there. Thank you. And we, it was, it was a, the best trip we've ever had. <laughs> yeah, it was just awesome, actually. And I hope I'll see some of you folks uh, in the Southern California in October if you can uh, join us on one of these. And I'd like to thank the World Puja Network for hosting us on uh, this show every two weeks. Uh, this has been Conversations with uh, Dr. Stephen Greer. And, uh, again, I'd like to thank uh, all of you for participating and for being so conscious and loving and supportive uh, over the last couple of years and uh, to just keep looking up and know that we're not alone and we're going to make this big transition all together. So God bless you all and until next time, goodbye. <laughs>